for the effector molecules that I wanted to mention, um, well, this really just kind of branches off into two things that I'm going to mention here. Two, three, BPG is one, and then the other thing is just kind of a collective thing known as the Bohr effect. No, not Niels Bohr, Christian Bohr, which I feel like people forget about that. <laughs> Anyways, so for 2,3-BPG, one of the things that you, uh, it's a byproduct of metabolism in our own cells. Whenever my muscle cells are working out, they're secreting a lot of BPG. If you're a smoker, you have a lot of BPG in your, your bloodstream. If you're hanging out at high altitudes, you have a lot of BPG in your bloodstream. Anyways, so what this is, is this is a anionic species. It's negative formal charge there. And it's going to just simply bind to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin at the T active site, or the T pocket, I guess you'd think about it. So, what are the effects of this? Well, the effects that it's going to have on hemoglobin is that it's going to reduce the affinity, reduce the oxygen affinity that hemoglobin has. So, this is good. And people don't always think of it, well, I mean, it's, it's good in context, right? So if, oxy or if red blood cells are leaving the tissue, leaving the bloodstream and going into the tissue, they're going to need to be exposed to effector molecules that are going to make them release their oxygen, right? Because there'd be no point if your hemoglobin stayed bound to oxygen as it went through your bloodstream. It, it wouldn't do anything, right? We need, to, we need to release that oxygen. Its job is to do that. So... This is one of the ways that it does that job, is through this, this compound here. So the T-pocket here is uh, kind of the, the hole, if you could, in the quaternary structure of the protein. And once it binds to this, the negative charge on the, of the anion is going to actually disrupt um, the, the positively charged uh, R groups on the beta chains. So the electrostatic interactions of the anion are going to, to interact with the positively charged R groups uh, lysine, for example, and on the beta chain, and this is going to induce a conformational change that is going to result in the stabilization of the T-state. So the T-state is going to be stabilized by this conformational change that's happening here, and once the T-state stabilizes, um, the way that I would describe this is that it's a negative effector molecule, and if we're reducing the affinity, that's the same thing as saying that we are increasing the Km, yeah, so here's the normal circumstances of this is sigmoidal curve. It's kind of a more S-like than I'd want it to be, but um, if we're increasing the Km, then the graft is going to shift to the right, right? Because we're increasing the Km, it's the same thing as saying that we're reducing affinity, and so it's stabilizing the T-state. And if you don't remember this negative effector, but the T-state is the deoxygenated form. Deoxy right there. So the only other thing that I wanted to say about this is remember in, and this is not general chemistry, this is biochemistry, where when I say electrostatic interactions, um, that's for the purposes of this, it's such a small amount that we consider that non-covalent interactions almost along the same lines of that of a hydrogen bonding or an intermolecular force. And so there's two other things that we can really say about 2,3-BPG is that uh, certain parts of our body have specific molecules designed to remove this. So this is removed from the lungs. I'm just going to say it's removed by a random mechanism that the book doesn't say at the lungs, which makes sense, right? I wouldn't want to have a low oxygen affinity at the lungs, right? I need to bind to oxygen at the lungs. And I don't know if you know this, but fetal hemoglobin which is um, used not only to treat sickle cell anemia, but also used um, uh, for transfusion purposes to help make your body become uh, better at adapting to uh, certain types of hypovolemic shock, has a higher affinity, a higher affinity for oxygen, because fetal hemoglobin has no 2,3-BPG binding, or I guess it should say reduced binding, um, but it's pretty much non-existent. So that's why fetal hemoglobin is so good at stealing oxygen from the mom's blood and giving it to himself. Actually, I had a friend of mine, he, he argued for the longest time that 
a child actually does meet the clinical definition of a parasite. But anyways, now let's talk about the Bohr effect. So the Bohr effect is all about two things, acids and carbon dioxide. So underneath this in blue, I'm going to draw out the reaction that both of these two compounds play a role in. So carbon dioxide, and I don't have room to write all this out, but carbon dioxide binds to water, which forms carbonic acid. And then through the use of, and I'm going to change colors to really reiterate this point, an enzyme known as carbonic and hydrase comes in and he's going to catalyze the reaction that's going to convert this into bicarbonate and protons, proton acids. So this form right here, and I'll, I'll clear this all out and we'll talk about H and, and CO2 later, but this form right here, this carbonate anion, this is how CO2 CO2 is transported in the plasma. This is how most of the transport of CO2 is transported in plasma. So this is how your body is able to expel this, this compound. Obviously, this reacts in equilibrium, and we're going to eventually have to get back to this whenever we reach the lung state, but in the tissue states and in the bloodstream, this is what you're going to find. Okay, so let's go ahead and clear uh, this everything up and so we can go in depth on the Bohr effect. So the Bohr effect's all about protons and carbon dioxide. And even though it's not really talked about much, the concentration of oxygen plays a huge role in determining the effects that both of these are going to have. So for now, let's just go and dive into the effects that protons have on the hemoglobin's affinity to bind to oxygen. Under normal physiological conditions, we have a pH of about 7.4. It's actually 7.35 to 7.45. Can't believe I remember that from my paramedic classes. <laughs> but anyways, this is the average pH that we have. Anything that we have that is gonna be less than that, less than 7.4, so say 7.2, for example. This is gonna cause changes that's going to reduce our affinity for oxygen, which makes sense, right? If I'm working out, I'm at the gym, I have a lot of lactic acid being produced because I'm working out, that's going to cause acidic conditions and that's why we do this. This is why we have to do CPR before we shock the heart. Well, a long time ago they used to uh, talk about doing that and they also used to give bicarbonate a long, long ass time ago in medicine. But um, the way that this works is that at a pH of 7.4, so say we have anything less than that, so like approximately 7.2, uh, you know what? Fuck it. Approximately 7.2. There we go. So and anything that we have that's at a pH of around this, what this does is we have obviously more protons in our solution. And so this um, is going to f mess with, I guess, the subunits of the salt bridge. So just like with 2,3-BPG uh, earlier, we have salt bridges linking all of our subunits together. Okay, so when we have acidic conditions, and I'm just going to go ahead and draw it down like this, that we have uh, protons coming in, I'll do that in gold because that's what I talked about. These protons are going to come in because it's an acid solution, and they're going to interact with the alkoxides. So we're going to have protonation of the alkoxides, right? Remember that being the oxygen parts of having um, uh, negatively type charges there, um, kind of the basic quote-unquote interactions, it's an acid-base reaction. Um, and what this results is, is that this is going to break the salt bridges that's holding this together, which pushes us to the C state slash stabilizes the deoxy state. Stabilizes the deoxy state. And the reason why I'm putting this in the middle will make sense earlier. So what this results in, this ultimate result is that oxygen is going to be released and into the tissue space. Okay, so let's talk about carbon dioxide or carbon. So just like we said before, whenever we have CO2 coming in, um, whenever carbon dioxide starts to build up into an extremely high concentration, now remember carbon dioxide is, is a gas. How do we measure the concentration of a gas? Well, we use, uh, you know, tor or atmospheres of pressure, something along those lines. And what this is going to do is this is going to react with the amino terminal groups to form a carbamate anion reacts with the amino terminal of your protein to form a carbamate. There you go, in case you can't tell from looking at that, 
Um, this was nitrogen here of the AMI group acted as a nucleophile to attack here, pushing one of the lone pairs or one of the pi bonds from the carbon dioxide to the outer side. I'm not going to really stress so much the individual mechanisms uh, of these reactions. This is not a major's course. But anyways, the carbamate is just that. It's an anion, which just how we said over here, this is going to interfere with the salt bridges and it's going to stabilize that. So this right here is going to, so this is going to interact with the salt bridge and the end result is that we're going to have a T-state that is being uh, shifted to that side of the equilibrium. It's going to stabilize the T-state and we're going to be in the deoxygenated form. They both do this by different mechanisms, but at the end of the day, it's a positive and negative charges used to destabilize uh, the, the salt bridges, or you can think of it as uh, acid bases versus anions. But anyways, the thing that I wanted to mention with oxygen, and I'll do it in the center here, is that oxygen too plays a role in this, right? So when the oxygen concentration in the blood, and by that I mean the of, of the uh, atmosphere as a pressure, or you can think of it as Tor goes down, this is going to increase the effects of this, and if the oxygen concentration goes up, it's going to decrease the effects of this. So most of the stuff that's happening here, most of what we're talking about with these reactions is happening when oxygen concentrations are low, and only really when they're low.